First of all, I would like to really thank the, the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I apologize in advance that I'm not going to talk really about machine learning in specific, but uh, my aim, I mean the aim of why I'm here, the, I would like to at the end of this conference to have uh, knowledge of what is actually what we could do with, with the data that we are producing. And so basically, I'm going to talk about uh, automatization of um, observations, data reduction, and time series analysis of Acti Galaxy Nuclei. So uh, my name is Francisco Bozo Nunez, and I am working for the Haifa Research Center for Theoretical Physics and Astrophysics in Israel, in collaboration with uh, Bochum University in Germany. The group members are here, uh, Doron Celoj from Haifa University, Chai Kaspi from Tel Aviv, Martin Haas from Bochum, Rolf Chini from Bochum, Wolfram Kolashny from Göttingen, and Jörg Uwe Pott from the Max Planck Institute. So first of all, this, these are the two uh, observatories that we are, we're, that we are using to, to, um, for our surveys. So on top, you can see basically the, the Negev Desert, where the WISE Observatory in Israel is located. And in the bottom, is most of you, <laughs> you know already, Chile. Uh, and this is basically the Bochum Observatory, which is close to the, the, the future location for the um, ELT. Uh, this are, oh, sorry, I have to go back. No. These are the telescope, basically, that we have. So on top, you, c you have a um, uh, uh, 15 centimeter telescope. This is a twin telescope. And we have an infrared telescope at the right. Uh, these are telescope, both teles telescopes, and these two telescopes here at the bottom are located in Chile, in the Bochum Observatory. And this is a 46 centimeter telescope, which is located in the Weiss Observatory in Israel. So I would like to talk about the AGN uh, unified model, but you, you heard a lot of, of this already, so I don't want to go in deep about that. So, but in principle, what matters in for, for our project is, if we, is that we are observing basically daily uh, AGNs uh, in daily basis. And the project is basically the echo mapping of AGN. So we are producing likers daily. So because we are interested on uh, estimating the black hole mass in AGNs, and how we do this basically is with the reverberation mapping technique. So basically, we take um, likers in different filters. So different filters measure different regions from the from the black hole. In in, in principle, this is an spectroscopic technique which at the beginning, I mean, you have to have many spectra uh, observations, and then you see how the, the emission lines, they vary with respect to the continuum, and the continuum is basically, uh, the emission line is basically a shifted version of what is the continuum. And this is due to light travel, effe uh, li light travel time effects, and with this you can have an idea of the size of, for example, the Rutland region, or the creation disk or the dust torus in general, very general. So, for example, there is a very important relation from CASPI 2000 about the broadland region, the luminosity, which is correlated. So, uh, also, at, the, at that time, uh, as you see, the relation had very strong SCATA. And then uh, in 2009 and 2010, with the work from Benz, when they realized that actually the host contributes significantly to the, to the luminosity, and then yet you have to subtract the host before doing analysis of the Likers, then the, the scatter of the relations chip decrease. So basically, what you have is the size, let's say, of the broadland region, and if, then you, if you combine this with the, with the velocity dispersion of the emission line, then you can estimate the black hole mass. So in 2011 and 2012, then we proposed basically to use, instead of a spectroscopy, photometric. So then we have several narrowband filters to catch the emission from the, from the, from the, um, the, the variability from the emission lines. And we have basically um, other bands to catch, for example, only continuum emission. And then we create Likers, like how you can see here. And then you we have beautiful Likers, for example, like for this object 
and where you can see that H alpha is clearly time shifted, is a time shifted version of the, of the continuum. And basically by using cross correlation techniques, we, we estimate the size of, in this case, the Brodan region. The same apply for the accretion disk, the same apply for the dust storage. So this is basically the idea. One, one of the problem is basically also that how we can decompose the nuclear flux from the host galaxy and in principle, what people is using is hi, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, high resolution images, but when you don't have such an image, then you have to think about something that how you can disentangle without, without modeling the host and then subtract it from the image and so on. So these are basically our image. You can basically resolve the host uh, not so well because our resolution is very low, slow, uh, small. So then, what we uh, use is basically the flux variation gradient analysis. So basically, we know how is the range of color of some uh, host for the AGNs, which are they are there, basically there in the plot. The host slope is very well known. We have a minimum and a, and a maximum range. And then the total flux of the, of the AGN lies in this linear relationship. So this total flux is composed of host, AGN, and then basically we can, at the time of our monitoring, we can obtain or calculate the host galaxy and then we subtract this host from the total flux and then we have the pure AGN contribution. And you can see at the plot at the right, basically this is the same but for different apertures. So if you, if you use different apertures for the photometry, then you trace the host also. So, but the, the nice thing of this method is that it doesn't really matter which aperture you use, you, you, have, you will always get the host, also the, the host also increase according to the aperture, so you can subtract it. And then finally, this is the most important uh, relation that I was talking about before, so the, the idea of our project is to try to populate this plot here as with many galaxies as we can, because the nice thing of this uh, work from, from, from CASPI is that we can use also AGNs as a standard candles in the future, if we can basically have the, the Broadland region size and the luminosity. The same is for the, for the dust torus, so you have also, by, because of reprocessing, the ultraviolet optical radiation to thermal radiation, and then you can estimate the, the, the distance between the black hole and, and the dust torus. You have basically emission, emission in, in the infrared, and then you see that the emission in the infrared is basically also the same time shifted. So the same correlation applies for the dust. So here you have nearly the same relationship. And so all of this is the science behind. But what we started is basically, so we thought, okay, so the scientific goals are to try to estimate the broadland region side, the equation this, the dust, but for that, we need actually high precision photometry. So we, we need a good time sampling. And to achieve both things, then we need, of course, automatized observations if you want to have good time samplings. And we have to also have automatized data reduction. And mainly because we are, uh, when we started this project, we had only one telescope, basically. So then we saw at that time, OK, so we don't need that much automatization and, and this kind of things. But now we have uh, six telescopes in Chile. We have uh, two telescopes in Israel, one meter telescope, more now working also. And therefore, I started the project of doing the automatization of the telescopes in the WISE Observatory. And basically, uh, we have images in different filters to, to, to study different components of the AGN. And we implemented like a weather station, cloud sensor, and so, and so on to take calibrations. I mean, the telescopes now are running fully robotically. They, I can control them from the iPad. <laughs> so the telescope open in the afternoon, and then they close during the day, uh, in the morning. There is also a method for cloud detection, for example, on the same images that we are obtaining. So we, we analyze the images, and we see the the amount of counts that we get, if we get low count, then this also means that there is a bad conditions and so on. The same with, um, with the stars, we also uh, resolve the images automatically and we can also see 
if you have a cloud somewhere, then the amount of detection decreased. And so basically, this is the, the, um, the pipeline. So this is con this, here there are two things connected. First is the automatization and robotization of the telescope. And the other part is the data reduction process. And the idea is that basically every night, the data that goes to the Hive cluster uh, in, in Haifa. So the data there is processed immediately. So every time we take an image from the telescope, it's transferred directly to the, to the cluster, and the data is being processed. So, and at the same time, we have basically different pipelines working together, doing quality image selections and different photometric analysis. So the quality image selection is based, for example, in the elongation of the star using sextractor. And then we know when an image is bad, then we reject it. And this is basic. So here we have at the right an, an example of uh, an image with our 46 centimeter telescope. And in the left, uh, an image with the 1.2 meter telescopes from the Schmidt telescope. And as you can see, our quality is quite nearly the same like a one meter telescope. So. So the photometry, and we have two pipelines running. So we use image subtraction techniques to estimate the fluxes. As you can see here, assume in the center, you have sometimes AGNs, which are basically in very crowded fields, where you can use image subtraction because you need several stars to construct a very nice model of the PSF and then subtra subtract it. And as you can see here, the the image subtraction pipeline was very nice. So what is left on the image is actually the variable sources. And the sources, well, basically, this is the AGN in the center. And the two sources which are on top are actually variable sources. So we can create the Likers also. And yeah. if image subtraction is not working properly because the, the field is too crowded, then we use aperture photometry. Then we use several apertures to trace also the nucleus, the host. And basically, we decide for the best aperture that maximizes the signal to noise. And then, this is basically the output that our pipeline has all the likers for different apertures. Uh, you, can, you can, of course, see how the likers, uh, the shape of the likers change according to the aperture, and then you can select the best one, the ones who has lowest scatter, and then you see how. They like it gets noisier and noisier when you use larger apertures. And then, so finally, this is the final product. We have image subtraction in one hand, and the other is aperture photometry. And then we calculate the person correlation coefficient because, in principle, one will, one will expect that the likers are all correlated, despite that they have a time delay. So, I mean, they should be correlated by using these two methods. So. As you see, for example, here in the, in the ratio of the Persian correlation coefficient, so you have, of course, image subtraction is superior for this particular AGN. So then, because the AGN is crowded, and therefore you use, it's better to use image subtraction. And the, the also the uncertainties of the image subtraction are much, much lower, as you can see, for example, in the, in the like here. So IMS is image subtraction, APH is aperture photometry. So the same thing is for the continuum time delays, which is the creation disk, basically because of light travel effects. So you have the, the, the creation disk, which should be stratified. So things which are closer to the black hole are hotter. Things that are outside are cooler, and so on. So if you have different filters, then you will expect also to have something like this kind of relation. So the time delay should increase with in a uh, function of wavelength. So, but the theory, what the theory finds is actually very different. So the theory find that um, observationally, we find that the, the accretion disk is nearly three times higher than what the theory predicts. So these are open questions, of course, that we want to solve with our monitoring. Therefore, we have only continuum likers in different bands. And we do the same technique. Basically, we cross-correlate all the continuum bands in order to find time delays. And uh, this is what we find. So it's actually nearly the same to previous studies. There is a relation between the, the time delay and the wavelength. Clearly increase 
with wavelength. And yeah, so in summary, basically we have the, the robotization of the telescopes and the automatization basically of the pipeline reduction. So in principle now we are having 14 filters, so we are covering nearly the complete uh, spectra. So yeah. And at the end, I, will <laughs> I, I put this use of machine learning techniques to analyze the AGN curves to obtain time delays and nuclear hosts. So I'm not, sh I'm not really sure how, how efficient it is. I mean, all of these things that I, I show now are done basically under supervision. So I'm not really sure how these things will work with, without supervision in the sense of having the computer deciding, for example, if one object is nice and what is the probability of one object should, we should continue monitoring one object according to the variability, for example. So I, I'm still thinking about this and I hope you have ideas or we can discuss this. And, yeah, thank you.